So you patch your Linux system. Everything looks clean, logs are quiet, services are running, but deep inside the kernel, something sinister is lurking. A backdoor, as we all know, is usually crafted with precision. It hides in plain sight. It doesn't show up in process uh, tree. In this video, we're going deep into the heart of Linux backdoors. We're going to peel back the layers between user space and kernel space to expose the real danger, kernel level backdoors. I will start by breaking down what Linux backdoors are, how they work, and why kernel backdoors are the most dangerous of them all. Then we will jump straight into the real world lab with TryHackMe sneaky patch room where a seemingly harmless system has been subtly compromised. Before we dive in, make sure to grab your free copy of Cybersecurity 101 Study Notes. It has got the basic foundations of cybersecurity that you can read and study if you are just getting started in this field. And if you're serious about leveling up, check out my premium study notes, also links in the description. And I've also put all other links, the write-up, any other links, helpful links that you need. The first type of kernel backdoors is user level backdoor, meaning it has still has an access to the system. However, it is not a privileged access such as kernel backdoors. So it's a user level. What are examples of user level backdoors? First, we have backdoored services. And here, the attacker would get access to the Linux system through maybe SSH. So if an attacker has access or has SSH credentials and they get access, we call this backdoored services. The other type of kernel backdoors is the one uh, the user level backdoors is through netcut reverse shells. And we've seen, or we see this a lot in uh, pen testing engagements and even in CTF scenarios, where you establish a connection back to the attacker to the victim machine using netcut, IP, and port, right? The third type is cron jobs. A cron job, as you know, is a scheduled task created to uh, execute a script or a binary in a repeated fashion. Okay, so basically an attacker, when they create a scheduled task, they would create a task that executes a reverse shell or a malicious binary. We call this also a kernel or user level kernel backdoor. And the last one is malicious aliases. It's where the attacker edits uh, the, the bash RC or the bash history file, not exactly the bash history file, it's the bash RC file to point to uh, a reverse shell or netcut reverse shell like this. So these are user level backdoors, and most kernel backdoors are user level backdoors, most common ones we see in uh, uh, cyber attacks or pen testing engagement. Of course, we're talking about less complex cyber attacks. Now the now we move up a little bit in the kernel backdoors ladder, and we discuss kernel backdoors. So kernel backdoors, as the name suggests, they target kernel, the Linux kernel. They are more uh, dangerous and harder to detect than user-level backdoors, but still they can be detected. So basically, kernel backdoors modify the Linux kernel by creating malicious modules or by modifying existing kernel modules, as we will see in the practical scenario. In the practical scenario, we will discuss or we will take an example where a system is infected with a kernel backdoor. We will see that kernel backdoors sometimes create new kernel modules or modify existing ones. So the objective is to hide malicious processes network ports, or uh, network connections. At the end, through the kernel module, the attacker will be able to uh, hide the rootkit, and through the rootkit, the attacker will be able to compromise the machine or basically control the machine. Uh, what are popular examples of kernel backdoors that you can research on your own? We have Adore NG and Diamorphine. You can research these, on your, these kernel backdoors in your spare time. And lastly, last thing to say about kernel backdoors is that they are harder to detect because you have to investigate the kernel modules and installed in your system and find out which one is the malicious one right and usually kernel backdoors that are considered more dangerous because they operate on the kernel level meaning they have higher privileges and the last type and yet the most dangerous type of kernel backdoors is the bios level backdoor so why this is the most dangerous factor obviously because it operates on the bios level so attackers would ship your bios with a backdoor and the backdoor operates on a BIOS level or in the BIOS level, basically bypassing all sorts of protection mechanisms. Um, basically, you cannot delete a kernel backdoor because it operates on the BIOS and it survives OS3 installs. Even if you format your system, the kernel backdoor would still operate. Okay. And the only way to delete the kernel backdoor is to uh, reprogram or reflash the BIOS. That's the only way. They are the most dangerous backdoors out there when it comes to Linux systems. Now, how to create Linux backdoors? 
So basically, we have a lot of tactics. You can do that manually by creating a C file and then compile it. However, there are more popular ways to, into creating a, a Linux factor. So basically, first we have the LD preload injection. It's where the attacker create a malicious shared library. Usually the file has an extension of SO. SO is a shared library or a shared object. So if you see an SO, it means it's a shared object created for a shared library. Attackers use this tactic to create uh, malicious Linux vectors. However, it's not all shared libraries are malicious, of course, but it's, it's still a tactic. Uh, next, we have SSH authorized access or authorized keys. Basically, the attacker would create or would create a public key of their own and then drop this public key or store it in the authorized keys file on the victim machine. Next, the attacker will be able to use SSH along with their uh, private key, right, to log into the victim machine without the need to sp uh, supply a password. Next, we have set UID binaries. Here, the attacker looks for binaries that have the suit bit set. Technically, the permission will be will, in the permissions. While listening to permissions of the file, you will see the bit S. It means that this file has a suit bit set and can be run or can be run as root. Next, we have bind or reverse shells. This is a very popular method of creating backdoors. Te technically, you establish a connection to the attacker machine using net cut. You either listen or connect. So it's either bind or reverse. And lastly, hidden users, after getting access to the attacker, to the victim's machine, you would create a dedicated user for you for, uh, for, for you, and then hide the user in ATC password. And lastly, backdoor packages. In here, you create a Linux-like binary, such as LS or PS, but it has malicious code, transferred to the victim machine, and you got a trojanized version of a legitimate Linux binary. Now, let's discuss LKMs, the most popular way, the most popular type of Linux kernel backdoors. So LKMs stand, stands for Loadable Kernel Module. It's a way for attackers to create uh, kernel backdoors using kernel modules. So what the attacker would do here first, the attacker would create a base uh, C backdoor written in C language. Okay. After that, the attacker would uh, create a make file. Okay. The make file with the C file together will result in a file with the extension KO. So that's the kernel module. The attacker would uh, create this kernel module and then would use commands such as ins mode or mode probe to load this kernel module into the uh, target system. Once the kernel module is loaded to the attacker's target system, the module now can uh, operate fully and basically make any make system calls. I modify, of course, the kernel structure. And after the kernel module is loaded using ins mode or mode probe, the attacker would create a base uh, script and then perform calls or trigger the modules. So I found sneaky patch room in TryHackMe, which is a perfect example for demonstrating how uh, to find or discover a kernel backdoor in your Linux system. Uh, basically here, the description says, a high value system has been compromised. Security analysts have detected suspicious activity within the kernel, but the attacker's presence remains hidden. Traditional detection tools have failed, and the intruder has established deep persistence. Investigate a live system suspected of running a kernel level backdoor. So here, you're not only uncovering a, a, a kernel backdoor, but you're also doing some sort of forensic analysis work. So this falls under an incident response and SOC analyst uh, responsibility here. So basically, after we open the machine, we have a terminal. That's all we have, and now we have to investigate the kernel backdoor or the alleged kernel backdoor in the system. To do this, first we're going to have to load the kernel modules. So we load the kernel modules using this command, ls mode, and then sort. So basically, here we get the output of all the uh, loaded kernel modules along with the size of each module. Okay, and the uh, the thing is here is we're going to have to find out. If there is a module or two that stand out among the other modules. So real quick here we have this one, S patch. Now why this stands out? Because it matches the name of the challenge. The other challenge is sneaky patch. So if you have an abbreviation for the name of the challenge, it could be S patch, right? And also we have, if we scroll up, now these are fine. You might think that there is a crypto uh, ransomware or crypto something, but it doesn't work this way. So you keep this out of the way and other modules look just fine. A good rule of thumb, if you are confused about the current module here, about one of these current modules, all you have to do is to just Google the 
kernel module. For example, let's say I'm confused about the kernel module named um, scrolling up this one. Okay, I don't know what it is. I want to make sure that I don't, I don't want to skip a malicious kernel back there, so I'll just Google it. Kernel module. And here in the official kernel documentations, you see we have the kernel module here and the description of the module. So just use the kernel documentation, search for the module, and you'll be able to find out whether it is naturally supposed to be in the loaded modules or it is worth investigating. Investigating. So basically, now we know that SPatch is the one that stands out. It's time now to investigate this module, this module further. We want to find out the files, associated files, who is the author. So we do that using the command sudo mod info, followed by uh, the name of the module, SPatch in my case. That's how it looks. So the file name here is spatch.ko, and that's the full location. Also, we get to see the uh, author. The author is Cypher, and the description is Cypher is always root. Now, basically, you won't see this in realistic scenarios. However, uh, the author and the location give indications about the nature of the uh, kernel model. So the author is Cypher. And uh, now, basically, real attackers or advanced persistent attacks, in advanced or any APT attacks, you would see the author name looks very much similar to the author name of other modules. Okay, for example, let's have a look at the uh, mod info of um, another module, say X stables. So mod sudo mod info X stables. So in X stable, the author here is, as you can see, it points to a real name and a real side that we can check out. Okay. Uh, so in APT attacks or advanced persistent attacks, you won't see just you won't see cipher. It's very uh, obvious that this is a, uh, a hacking or a kernel mod, a kernel backdoor or something that's not supposed to be here. However, you will see something like this, okay, to uh, make the kernel module as sneaky as possible. Okay, let's go back to the kernel module we are investigating. So now it's time to have a look at the associated file with the module. Every kernel module, as we said earlier, has an associated file. So we're gonna uh, investigate this file by copying the full location, uh, this one. And one way of investigating the kernel file is using strings. Okay, let's use strings and pipe the output to less. Let's see here. So we have a Linux get flag. We have a file, text file, under the temporary directory named cipher output. It's also worth checking out. We have bin sh, a shell, popping uh, out. And we have get flag. And then we have, as you can see, the C file was executed. And then we have the home directory is set to root. Failed to create. We have errors. Okay, let's continue. So far, so forth. All evidence points out that this is the kernel back that we're looking for. Here is the secret. So we have a secret file here, and not secret file, sorry, it's a hexadecimal a secret. And then we have path variable description. Okay, so it looks like the attacker got access to the system, as you can see here, using the bsh, popped a shell, set the home directory to root, executed the C file of the kernel module, and then, as you can see, the kernel module was created for the kernel vector. So now to get the flag, we can just copy this, convert this from hex to text. So use Cyberchef. And we add a recipe from hex. And that's your flag. Okay, that's for the challenge.